Thank you for spending this next hour with us. We'll be getting uh, going in just a couple of seconds. Welcome everyone. Just give us a few seconds and we're gonna get started. Uh, thank you for joining us. We're really excited about this. Uh, and we know that you are excited about spending the next hour with us. So just, we'll get started shortly. Awesome. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Money Moves uh, webinar today. I wanted to welcome everyone. My name is Cynthia Garcia, and I have the honor to serve as a Deportation Defense Manager here at United We Dream. We're super happy that you're joining us. Uh, so welcome. Uh, if you're barely jumping on, welcome to today's webinar. For those who are new, to United We Dream. We are the largest immigrant youth-led network in the country, and most of our staff and leaders are undocumented immigrant youth, just like me. Today, we're here to talk about money moves. Uh, all of us at United We Dream are so excited to learn together from an amazing expert who will share some of her knowledge with us today. Ileana Perez with the HD, uh, PhD, that means that she's a doctor, y'all, uh, is the director of research and entrepreneurship at Immigrants Rising. In addition to that, she's undocumented, just like me, has DACA and knows what it's like to struggle, to survive, and how to thrive in despite of it all. I also wanna welcome uh, folks here from many other partner groups who have helped to bring all of you here. Community Change, Dream.us, Fair Immigration Reform Movement, Make the Road New Jersey, Mano Amiga, President's Alliance, and many more. So normally we'll all be in the same place, but with the situation that is in the world happening right now, we wanted to bring you this information, even if we're all spread out. So I'm in Oklahoma City with all my Okies. Ileana is in California. And behind the scenes, we have other folks, Juliana Nacimiento, which is her birthday. So happy birthday to Juliana, who is in DC. Uh, Rodrigo Huerta, who is in Boston. And even though we're all over the country and all over the place, we're all undocumented and we're gonna get going through the same things. We're seeing so many of our people losing jobs. We're seeing many of our people getting sick. And we're seeing the inequities that we faced before COVID. And during COVID, they're becoming even more clear. And we know our people know how to hustle and that with everything that is going on, we're gonna have to find new and creative ways to make it. But I know that we will. And we know it because we are strong as people. So this series on financial education is part of an ongoing efforts to bring you resources, culture and healing to make it through this uncertain time and so for now, I'm gonna turn it over to our expert, which is Ileana from Immigrant Rising to get us going. But before I do that, I want to go over a couple of technical details. One, you can expect this session to last about an hour. It's being broadcast here through Zoom or on Facebook Live. Two, for questions, 
You can ask questions at any time in the Zoom chat through the ask question function. My colleague Juliana is going to be compiling the questions and we'll do our best to answer them at the end. And if you're viewing this through United We Dream Facebook page, you can also post the questions in the comment section. If you're seeing this on uh, Facebook through one of the different organizations, we will do our best to answer the questions after the webinar. Three, there will be polls through this session. Ileana will ask some questions to hear what you have to say. So we will this, we'll do this through an online tool called menti.com. That is M-E-N-T-I dot com. You can open this in your computer or on your phone and Elena will give you a code to get in, and then you can answer the questions. It's really easy, and she'll explain more during uh, the presentation, and you may wanna get it ready now. So again, menti.com. We'll also be sharing with you some resources to learn more about various topics. Keep an eye in the, in the chat and Zoom to the comment section or on Facebook where we'll post the resources when in, Ileana invites you to check them out. After the session, we'll drop the link to a survey from Immigrant Rising that will be great for you to fill out so we can hear more from you. So for now, I'm really excited to turn the mic over to Ileana Perez from Immigrants Rising. Great, thank you so much, Cynthia, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you so much again to everyone at United We Dream who has done so much work behind the scenes to make this possible today. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Super excited to share um, a lot of great information and resources with all of you. Um, a couple of things, again, this is um, a two-part webinar series. Um, today's portion is gonna be a rather technical, a lot of kind of heavy information to take in. Don't worry, we're gonna be sharing the slides. There's gonna be a recording. We're gonna point you to a lot of resources, so don't feel like you have to take it all in at once. We will definitely be sharing more information. And the second part of the webinar, we definitely encourage you to join us because it'll be a much more guided exercise where you'll all get the opportunity to think about your own skills and abilities to be able to engage in this kind of work. The agenda for today, I'm going to do um, very briefly, I'm going to introduce myself, our organization Immigrants Rising. We're going to talk a little bit about this concept we call the Undocu Hustle, talk a little bit about some work we're doing related to um, Beyond DACA. Then we're going to get into kind of a rather technical portion, really understanding legal and tax considerations around these options. That's where you'll see a lot of polling throughout, and I'll invite everybody to participate. Um, for those of you joining us on Facebook Live, uh, you can also participate as well. Um, then we're going to briefly share some information around the concept of independent contracting, what it means to start a business, and if we have some time, I'll share a couple of inspiring stories of some entrepreneurs and a Q&A session. Um, uh, thank you again, Cynthia, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I'll just add a little bit more about myself. Um, I am a DACA recipient. I've been in this country since 1995. Um, I came alongside my parents, my younger brother from um, the state of Hidalgo in Mexico, um, and um, have been able to navigate through the educational system um, without DACA all the way up to my PhD program. So um, there are definitely a lot of opportunities, a lot of support for anyone out there that is looking to pursue to higher education, it's definitely a possibility, um, even for folks who were not, not eligible for DACA. Um, in addition to that, I had to figure out um, many um, creative ways for myself to be able to make a living. Um, I graduated from college back in 2009 before DACA came along, so I didn't have work authorization, social security number, driver's license. Um, so that's where um, a lot of this great work that I've been doing with Immigrants Rising began with myself, trying to figure out how to make a living. Um, and I've been extremely fortunate to also have my parents who are entrepreneurs themselves. They're undocumented um, and that my dad is a proud um, landscaping um, business owner. My mom owns a furniture refurbishing business and they just find multiple ways to hustle. So um, definitely a lot of this comes from um, my own experience watching my parents, watching the undocumented community really be able to thrive in this country regardless of immigration status. 
So for those of you not familiar with Immigrants Rising, um, formerly called Educators for Fair Consideration, E4FC, a little complicated to say in both Spanish and English before, so we've gone through a rebranding and a name change. Um, the organization has been around for over a decade. Uh, we um, aim to empower undocumented young people to achieve their educational and career goals through personal, institutional, and policy transformation. Um, over the past few um, years, we've evolved from um, providing scholarships to undocumented students in the Bay Area to really having um, a wide range of programs and services um, that I'll walk you through um, in terms of um, uh, when, I, when I show you our website. Um, I want to start us off um, definitely by um, mentioning the fact that we are currently um, living under a, a crisis that has affected many individuals, not just undocumented individuals. Um, so um, I want to share a few resources that um, and the undocumented community can definitely access. We have a list um, called Tangible Support for Undocumented Students that is a live document. We're constantly updating it. I won't go through the full list, but as you can see here, there's information around around accessing um, mental health services, connecting to free and low cost resources, relief funds, there's support specifically for free uh, businesses and freelancers, et cetera. So definitely encourage you all to take a look at that. Um, we also host weekly wellness gatherings that are led by our mental health advocate, um, Lily Campos. Um, these, uh, this is an opportunity for the undocumented community to find a safe space, to be able to um, connect with mental health professionals, um, to really cope with a, a lot of what's going on currently. So before I go on to the heavy content, I want to get to know you all in the audience. So as was mentioned before, we have um, a couple of questions and we'll be using Mentimeter throughout. The first question I wanna know is what kind of work are you all currently engaged in? Uh, Full-time employment, part-time employment, independent contracting, are any business owners out there? Um, and also if folks are not currently working, this will help me sort of tailor the information a little bit better. So I'm gonna click on the link here. And we're going to get to see some live results here in front of us. So, okay, we have a couple of business owners. That's super exciting. Feel free to chat in the kind of businesses that you have so we can um, see that. Okay, some independent contracting, some individuals employed full time, some part time employees. I'll let you all submit your responses here. Okay, a few more independent contractors, a few more business owners. I see here somebody starting a nonprofit. Um, and an, another question um, while well, we're waiting for folks to cast in their votes, um, this presentation is going to be recorded and we are going to be having the recording available for folks. Great. Um, it's exciting to see a wide array of um, the kind of work that you all are engaged in. And super exciting to see folks already pursuing some of these entrepreneurship opportunities. Okay, well, this is exciting to see. Thank you, everybody. Um, definitely, uh, folks, business owners, independent contracting, feel free to chime in with um, some information about your business as well. Always a good opportunity to engage in marketing and promotions for your business. Uh, we're going to go on to the next question. Um, and in the next question, um, let me double check here. Okay, so in the next question, I'd like to know how familiar are you about entrepreneurship as an alternative to employment? And you can just, just use the sliding bar. Okay, we're at, the, we're at about a midpoint here, a little bit less now. Okay, okay, so we, um, we have a, the majority of you here kind 
that maybe are a little bit familiar with, the, with some of these options. Okay, this is very helpful. And I'll let a few more folks chime in with their responses. Okay, and it's definitely okay for be um, at a broad spectrum here. There's definitely plenty of information for those of you that um, may be just becoming familiar with these options, as well as for folks that may already be pursuing these options. So let's go ahead and go on to the third question here. Um, what's one thing you would all like to learn today? Ooh, investing, how to start an LLC, how to make money quickly. Okay, wow, let's see if I can catch some SBA contracting opportunities, working for yourself, discipline, how to launch a 501c3. Okay, lots of interest in learning about a wide variety of topics related to making money. Um, let me see, so we have some real estate investing. We may not get an opportunity to do much investing, but that's a good idea for um, a, maybe a future, perhaps a future webinar all around um, investing options, but we're definitely cover, going to cover a lot of information around independent contracting, how to start your own business, um, let's see, how to maximize the I-10. Yes, definitely, we're gonna cover quite a bit of that information today. Um, let me see, somebody said all of the above, which is a good way to encompass everything coming in. <laughs> Legal liabilities, definitely a lot of information around that. Wow, thank you so much um, for participating in this. I'm definitely gonna try to cover um, as much information as possible. But again, um, while today's presentation is gonna be very technical, the second portion is gonna be a lot more hands-on with more steps on how to get started with your business, concrete steps to get started with independent contracting. Um, and I like the idea of um, perhaps a, a different webinar around um, investment, real estate, which is definitely um, something that seems to be of interest to folks. So. I'm going to go ahead and get back here to our presentation. Okay, so um, a little bit about the undocu hustle. So very early on when we started to do this work, um, we noticed that particularly among the undocumented community, the term entrepreneurship doesn't really seem to resonate much with folks. Um, it's, some, it's not sort of a common term that we would think of as ourselves, or I know my parents would probably never think of themselves as entrepreneurs, even though this is all they've been doing their entire lives. Um, so instead, we um, sort of came up with this term, the undocu hustle. And this really comes from the fact that as undocumented individuals, we're constantly having to hustle. Uh, we're constantly having to figure out our own opportunities, really open doors that were not previously open to us. So it's always sort of been part of our identities because we really have not had another choice. And it's been as a result of, the, as, of this undocu hustle that so many opportunities have opened up in terms of educational access, in terms of career opportunities. Um, it's the great advocacy work that um, really encompasses sort of this way of life for us as undocumented individuals. So this is what we have called sort of a lot of the we have done, a lot of the work we've done around um, getting the word out about these um, ways to generate income. So um, the place to start, for those of you that may not be very familiar with our Immigrants Rising content, is on our Making Money landing page. You are going to be able to find this on um, immigrantsrising.org. Under Start Here, we actually have landing pages for a lot of our content. Um, I'm going to go over our Beyond DACA, but if folks are interested in learning more about long-term immigration remedies, you may want to check out the Getting Papers. There's making money, if folks are interested in more about mental health, college access, these would be the place to start. We have information around um, on here. We have a great on docu hustle video. I won't have time to show, but definitely encourage you all to check this out. We have a lot of resources that um, we're gonna be um, discussing and adding into the chat today. We also give money away. We have an amazing entrepreneurship fund where we give money to undocumented social entrepreneurs across the nation. We give up to $2,000 grants on a monthly basis. The application is um, open all the time. We read applications every month and give away um, grants ranging from $1,000 to $2,000. 
Um, we also partner with an organization called Venturize, which is a referral where anyone across the nation can find a local service provider um, that can help you with developing a business idea, with, um, it can help you access financial capital, they can help you lots of different um, questions related to entrepreneurship. Um, you can also join our Facebook group, Entrepreneurs at Immigrants Rising, connect with us, hear uh, inspirational stories from many of the individuals that have received funding from us, who have gone through our programming, and get updates from us. That's our Making Money landing page. Um, in addition to that, we know that um, there's a lot of anxiety, um, especially among um, those of us who have DACA, who are you know, wondering what's gonna happen. We're all sort of you know, waiting on Mondays and Thursdays for this looming Supreme Court decision. So um, we have created a landing page called the On DACA, specifically with information for individuals um, who are looking for information, resources to um, really sort of start to think about perhaps some um, next steps um, um, beyond um, what DACA has in place for us. So there's information here around renewals for DACA, definitely encouraging everybody to renew as soon as possible. Um, we have some information about long-term immigration options. If any of you have not had an opportunity to get um, a review of your immigration case, we highly encourage you to take a look at our immigration legal intake service. There's information around, again, our entrepreneurship fund, how to launch your business, information also about mental health support. So definitely encourage you all to take a look at these pages for additional information. Um, and so moving on to talking about undocumented entrepreneurs in the US, um, there are actually quite, you know, many of us undoc undocumented entrepreneurs in the US. And um, these are just a couple of figures that come from national census estimates. But when you take into account all the different entrepreneurial activities that our families engage in, I guarantee that these numbers would be much higher. But just to give you a glimpse of um, the number of undocumented entrepreneurs in the nation, about 10% of the undocumented documented uh, population is engaging in entrepreneurship. That's almost 800,000 individuals generating approximately $15.2 billion in business revenue. Um, on here, you'll probably um, have seen some of these amazing folks, um, such as Yosimar, who's an amazing poet, Danae Joseph, who is engaging in political consulting, Maria Mendez, who's a street vendor out in Chicago, who is helping other individuals um, get licensed and, and start their businesses. Bo um, is, amazing, is an amazing artist um, who you can check out his um, amazing work and amazing apparel um, in, in his websites. So um, again, all of this is to really just sort of set the foundation that entrepreneurship is among us. This is very much part of the undocumented community and it comes across in so many different ways, whether it's formal entrepreneurship, whether it's selling Avon, selling princess house, landscaping, construction. Um, this is what we do, this is who we are. Um, and so what you know, these trainings are intended to do is to really talk about legally why this works, how to get information around tax is how to maximize the use of your I-10. But again, this is really within the context that this is part of the undocumented community and we just got to find ways to formalize this. We got to find ways to um, grow these businesses. So when I talk about income generation, I mean that these are opportunities for anyone, regardless of immigration status. These are not opportunities just for immigrants, just for undocumented people. Anyone can pursue these options. Very important to note that this is not employment. And I'll talk a little bit about legally, uh, the biggest challenge for the undocumented community is not having work authorization, meaning people can't get employed. But these other opportunities are available regardless of immigration status. The way I talk about these opportunities is sort of twofold. Um, I typically start off by talking about freelancing opportunities, which include independent contracting, consulting, participating in the gig economy. These are opportunities that are pretty low touch, kind of low risk, not a lot of money that you gotta invest into uh, becoming, um, you know, engaging in freelancing. Oftentimes you can use apps to find work and in the second part of the training, I'll walk you actually to where you can find these kind of opportunities. The second part is really more of the formal definition of entrepreneurship, where you actually do start a business. In order to engage in these kind of opportunities, you gotta learn about business plans, about marketing strategies, how to get clients, um, maybe do a market analysis to figure out like, you know, how do you actually sell um, your services or your products? 
And then you have to think about, well, how do I get started? I think many of you are probably familiar with the LLC. I've been hearing that quite a bit. That's a great business model, but it actually requires a lot of knowledge, a lot of resources ahead of time. So maybe you may want to start off with a sole proprietorship where you become your own owner, kind of get the feel for what this looks like, and then progress into sort of the more advanced um, business structures, which would be the worker cooperative model. Um, so let's make sure that all of this information is sticking and that this is not just a lecture. So let's go back to our Mentimeter. What type of work is possible without work authorization? And I'm going to go back into then on to the next Mentimeter here. And let's see if folks are paying attention here. Let me just get to the right. Okay, what's one thing a person without work um, Sorry, wrong question here. This should be this one. Oh, for some reason it's not coming up here. Give me one second. Okay, here we go. What type of work is possible without work authorization? So this is the question we're answering. Um, it's either Uber. Again, this is without work authorization. So we have Uber, Lyft drivers, owner of a law firm, data analyst, real estate agent. Okay, okay. Okay, well, this is a bit of a trick question, I have to admit, because in fact, all of these different activities are possible without work authorization. So um, Uber Lyft drivers um, are currently classified as gig economy workers. I know it is definitely contentious, and I just saw today in the news that the state of California is trying to reclassify individuals, um, but um, a gig economy type of work does not require work authorization. I realize that there may be driver's license restrictions across the state, but other kinds of gig economy um, are, do not require work authorization. Undocumented people can become lawyers. I realize that there are also state-specific license, professional licensing requirements, um, but if a state uh, does allow an undocumented person to um, get licensed as a lawyer, an individual can in fact um, start um, their own law firm. Um, data analyst. Um, data analyst, um, I have engaged in quite a bit of data analysis work myself as an independent contractor, and it can actually also, individuals can start their own companies um, um, with data analysis. Real estate agents, um, a good friend of mine, Norma, has a real estate license um, in California, has been able to go through all the certifications. Um, and again, I do realize that some of these do require professional licensing. And um, I was just on a call a few minutes ago with um, right before I jumped on this webinar with some folks out of New York who are looking to advocate to pass a professional licensing bill. I've been in calls with uh, New Jersey folks, with um, Colorado folks. So there's a lot of advocacy around the professional licensing bill um, to open up new opportunities. Okay, so thank you everybody for participating. So legally, why does all this work? So many of you are probably wondering, is this even legal? I don't, I don't really know how all this works. Well, many of you may actually be familiar with the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986, IRCA, which um, states that it is illegal to knowingly employ unauthorized workers in the United States. So while IRCA adjusted the status of approximately 3 million undocumented people back in 1986, it also intended to close the door to any other undocumented immigrants coming to this country. And the way it did that is by um, um, creating this I-9 system, which does require individuals to have work authorization, a green card, a social security number, to engage in employment. Again, the big key in all of this is employment is very much restricted uh, in federal law to undocumented individuals. However, there was an exception embedded in IRCA. So again, this is an exception embedded in federal law. So this cuts across all states. So for those of you joining us in any state, this is super important to know that at the federal level, independent contractors or business owners are excluded from um, 
um, the, sort of the, um, the, the laws that are very much focused around employment. So what happens with independent contractors is, and business owners is that they can use an I-10 to legally earn a living in the United States as long as they pay taxes. So all of this, the purpose of all of this working and the purpose of the exception being included in IRCA has to do with paying taxes which then leads to, well, how does all this work? So then what happens is that individuals and the same form is used for independent contractors, for business owners, complete something called the W-9 form, and I'll show um, a little bit of information about that. Um, furthermore, we've actually found that engaging in entrepreneurship may be advantageous to undocumented individuals who may be able to adjust their immigration status because there will be evidence that they were generating income and paying taxes. So again, this is at the federal level. Anyone, regardless of immigration status, can um, engage in entrepreneurship opportunities with an ITIN, social security number, and without work authorization. So what happens is that there's an exchange of forms for the purposes of paying taxes. There has nothing to do with immigration status. You don't have to um, have work authorization, social security number. The W-9 form is a pretty standard form, again, for individuals, corporations, limited liability corporations. And it's simply a form where individuals or companies put in either a social security number, an individual tax ID number, or an employer identification number, which is a number assigned to a business, for the purposes of the client, then keeping track of how much money they're paying the worker. So at the end of the day, it's basically just an exchange of information so that somebody is held responsible for paying taxes at the end of the day. The W-9 form does not ask for proof of work authorization. It also does not ask for a copy of your social security number or your ITIN. So on the flip side of things, clients then, um, there is a federal statute that you all should know about that does prohibit clients from knowingly engaging with undocumented individuals. Basically, this is very similar to employers hiring undocumented people with fake papers. What ends up happening with independent contractors and business owners is that it becomes extremely complicated to even try to figure out whether independent contractors or business owners are actually undocumented unless there's some type of written communication. So this knowingly engaging information refers to say, for example, you sending an email to somebody and saying, hey, I'm undocumented, I'm a data analyst, and I'm looking to get some contract work. For whatever reason, somehow or another, somebody goes after this particular client, calls ICE, and then um, ICE is forced to open a claim against that particular client. In the case of a subpoena, then an email exchange like that could definitely um, be used um, against that particular client. Not necessarily me as a worker, but the client because they knew that I was undocumented and still contract with me as, an, as a data analyst. However, we've worked with several legal organizations and we haven't found um, it, this um, federal statute to actually be used. The reason for that is because ICE is not looking at independent contractors, business owners. So that's, it's, one, it's extremely complicated. It's really expensive to try to go out after people. And in any of the forms that I talk about, again, there's no box you have to check saying you're undocumented, saying you don't have work authorization. So the moral of this story is that when you're trying to engage with clients, either as an independent contractor or business owner, you shouldn't be talking about your immigration status. It's not relevant. It's, it has nothing to do with your work. Instead, you should be thinking about how do I um, you know, create a great portfolio? How do I showcase my skills? How do I um, you know, make sure that my projects look really great to be able to um, get even more clients? It just, you should never be talking about immigration status because in the case, again, of a worst case scenario, you may actually be getting a client in trouble if you start to talk about your immigration status. So again, instead, the whole purpose of all of this is for you to be able to learn about your own skills abilities, be able to market yourself, and come at this from a business perspective. You're just trying to engage a business, you're trying to look for clients, your immigration status should not even play a role in any of these conversations. So what ends up happening on the client side, going back to the taxes, is that they complete a form called 1099, and it's basically just a summary of how much money they paid me, for example, as a contractor data analyst, and now I'm held responsible for paying taxes at the end of the year on the, on the summary of the amount of money that was paid to me. 
Um, and then this same form 1099 is sent to the IRS. So the, this is like all the exchange of forms that happen. There is nowhere on here is an I-9 form. So the I-9 form, again, is the one that you need work authorization, green card, social security number. In the interaction between you as a worker, as an independent contractor, business owner, you just have to worry about making sure that you, know, you and your client are on the same page about the forms that you need to interact with for the purposes of paying taxes. So another poll, what form do clients submit for tax purposes? And I have here a couple of the images for some of these forms. So let's go back to our Mentimeter here. So is it the W-9 form, 1099 form, the I-9 form? And I purposely asked this question because it can get a little bit confusing. They all kind of sound the same. There's a lot of nines all over the place. <laughs> and again, I do see that there are quite a few um, questions and comments popping up. And so I will leave um, um, about approximately 10 minutes. I'm gonna try to leave. So I'll keep going for about another 10 minutes of the presentation and make sure that we have plenty of time to address any questions. Okay, what forms do clients, and again, there's an interaction between me as a worker and there's an interaction with me and the client. So the client submits the 1099 form. So remember the W-9 form is the number that me as an independent contractor or business owner, I'm gonna give that to my client. And it's only for the purposes of that client sending back to me a 1099 form to let me know how much money they paid for me to pay taxes on that and for the IRS to know what the exchange was. Again, the I-9 form is for employment purposes and that is the form that unfortunately, without work authorization, we will not be able to submit. Great, thank you everybody. So let's move on here. So let's talk a little bit about the ITIN, social security numbers, employer identification numbers. Another one of these, lots of numbers floating around, so let's talk about what's going on with these. So the individual tax ID number is a number that is given by the Internal Revenue, Revenue Service, and it's only used for federal tax reporting. However, there's a lot of great benefits to having an ITIN, including being able to open bank accounts and establish credit. I was able to um, open my first bank account with my ITIN um, about 12, 13 years ago, and I was able to build credit using that. I was able to um, do quite a bit of like financial work um, starting 12 years ago with my ITIN. By the time I got a social security number through my DACA, I was able to transfer all my credit history from my ITIN to my social security number. There's actually a whole process for that that's written um, in a couple of the guides that we'll be sharing. The ITIN is also extremely useful to be able to engage in independent contractor or business startup type of work. Because again, if you remember in the W-9 form, you have to have a number, whether it's an ITIN, SSN, EIN. So um, another benefit of having an ITIN is that if you do choose to incorporate as a business, you will get something called an employer identification number, which is a number given to a business. So the so SSN, the ITIN is given to individuals, EIN is given to businesses. Very important for those of you who may have the DACA recipients in the audience, regardless of the possible termination of DACA, for if for whatever reason you were not able to renew a DACA, your social security number will all be, always be yours. And you should never go back to getting an I-10 because that number will remain yours forever. I know that our DACA cards, um, social security cards say not valid without work authorization. We're not talking about work authorization here. We're talking about entrepreneurship, independent contracting, business startup that has nothing to do with us having work authorization. So for whatever happens related to DACA, we will always keep that social security number with us. And in an adjustment of status, that same social security number is gonna be our number. So let's see if folks are with us here. So if a DACA recipient lost their work authorization and they're looking to engage in contracting work using their social security number, is this a possibility? Let's see. And this one is an open-ended question. Okay. Okay, let me see. Lots of yeses, lots of yeses. Okay, good, good, we're on the same page here. This is 
by far one of the number one questions I get. So I'm so glad to hear that we're on the same page here. So yes, we DACA recipients will continue to keep their social security numbers. However, so what happens um, to individuals that do not have um, a social security number? Totally okay. So um, how do you actually get an ITIN? So again, we're good, we're good with the social security number situation, ITINs. So um, individuals who cannot get a social security number, which are foreigners who come to this country, not necessarily just undocumented people, would need to complete the form W-7 and provide original documents. It's actually a rather unfortunately complicated process to get an ITIN. I should say that I was able to get an I-10 because my parents filed for taxes and um, added my brother and I as dependents. So I, my brother and I were automatically given I-10s. So for those of you that may be claimed as dependents, you may already have an I-10. So you may wanna check um, ahead of time to make sure if you have an I-10 or not before even trying to start the application because it is rather complicated. Um, I highly recommend working with an IRIS authorized certified agent because if you do, then you avoid having to submit um, original documents. You can actually submit copies of your documentation. Um, I have links on here and I'll share additional resources where you can actually find a certified acceptance agent ne near you. You can also check out the VITA clinics as well. So there are probably a lot, a, lot of, a lot of questions here, but I'm gonna try to keep it short for the purposes of today's uh, presentation. And we do have many more resources. We have a whole guide about the I-10, and we were able to collaborate with Professor Francine Lipman, um, who walked us through a step-by-step -step of what the W-7 form requires to get an I-10. So um, we are moving rather quickly here, but I want to make sure that you all have at least the foundational information to learn about all these sort of like tricky um, topics here. Next, probably the natural question is, well, what's going on with taxes? How do I file taxes? What are all the forms? So we talked a little bit about the forms, but basically what happens with filing taxes as an independent contractor, freelancer, business owner, it is a little bit more complicated. The reason it's complicated, it's because there's no employer withholding. So many of you who have ever worked as employees, you'll notice we don't get our full checks. There's like money that gets taken out for benefits, for taxes, for retirement. There's a ton of money that gets taken out. Guess what? As an independent contractor, business owner, you're gonna get all that money. If you charge $10,000 for a contract, you're gonna get the full $10,000. But you have to know that at the end of the year, you're gonna to have to pay both federal and state taxes. So that's gonna to have to be about 25% of those $10,000 that you were paid. Um, what happens with the forms, again, you're gonna get a 1099 form for any work done as an independent contractor or business owner. Um, if you are currently working as an employee, you may get a W-2. So for many years now, I've done work as an employee with Immigrants Rising and the occasional contractor work. So I end up with um, a couple W-2s. I occasionally do some part-time employment too. So I get a bunch of W-2s, I get a bunch of 1099s, and all of that is what I use to pay my taxes. You're only gonna receive a 1099 from a client if you um, were paid $600 or more. That does not mean that you don't have to report your taxes. You should really be keeping track of how much money you're getting. Sometimes the 1099s get lost, so you should really start to become very organized and prepared with the amount of money that is coming in. Super important to know that as a independent contractor, business owner, you can deduct expenses. This is amazing. I didn't learn this until a few years later. Nobody told me this, so I'm gonna tell you all now. You can deduct a wide variety of expenses and deductions. These can be anything from mileage, if you use your car to get from one place to another, any flights, any hotels, 50% of your meals, um, a home office, if you're doing work from home, uh, your cell phone bill, some of your utilities, there are lots of different expenses that you can put in. So say for example, in that $10,000 contract, you spend $6,000 miscellaneous um, business expenses, you're only gonna be held respons responsible for paying taxes on 4,000 of those dollars, which is much better than the full amount. But it really does take being organized, having your receipts, keeping a closed tab of all the money that's going in and that's going out. I literally have like boxes because I worked for so many years as an independent contractor. I'm like terrified of like my immigration status. So I keep every single paper. So I have boxes and boxes of receipts. I have modernized over the last few years and I use an app called 4C, but there are many apps out there where you could just take pictures of your receipt. So 
There are ways to make this much easier, but it does require staying organized, keeping a budget, keeping a close track of how much money in, how much money is going in, how much money is going out. Um, and I also do recommend working with a professional tax preparer who understands the independent contractor business side of things because it just becomes much easier to work with somebody who can ask you, are you using a home office? Are you, you know, spending money on food? Are you doing this rather than you like trying to figure out on your own? Like, does this count? Does this not count? So at least for the first time, I recommend working with somebody who can help. There's also free file, so, uh, free file software for incomes below a certain amount. Um, and then again, I highly recommend working with a tax preparer accountant for um, income above $66,000. Highly recommend working with the IRS low income taxpayer clinics. And again, we're, there's a lot of resources on that, on anything related to the ITIN taxes on our resources, you're gonna see links to um, these two resources. So for the last couple of minutes, since we are um, almost at that 10 minute mark, I'm briefly gonna go over very basics about these two options, independent contracting and business ownership. Highly encourage you all to join us in the second part of this training where we're actually gonna go through the steps to get started with independent contracting and to get starting with business startup. This is just teaser content, kind of get you, you know, in the groove of how all of this works. So there are guidelines to working as an independent contractor. You can't just sort of turn employment into independent contractor. Like it really does have to follow some specific guidelines that have to do with the fact that you have to control the work that you're doing. You have to control your hourly rate, your, um, how often you're going to get paid. And um, you have to control the kind of relationship, meaning that it has to be a client independent contractor relationship. Unfortunately, we won't have time to go over this in, in full detail, but in the second part of the training, we will, and that'll be a very much step-by-step. -step. So what happens with independent contractor versus entrepreneurship is that Whereas in employment, we're kind of used to creating a resume. With entrepreneurship, we create a portfolio with um, a lot of activities, projects that we've engaged in. In employment, we apply for jobs. In entrepreneurship, we look for clients, gigs, um, all over the internet with friends and family. With employment, we typically wait to see if a job posting kind of matches our, um, our education, our experience. With entrepreneurship, you don't wait. You're going to be contacting clients all the time and getting your hustle on. With employment, you may visit some job fairs. With entrepreneurship, you're gonna create a list of all the people you know, all your friends and family, and reach out to them. Hey everybody, I've, I'm engaging in some consulting independent contractor work, or I'm starting a business. Here's a list of all the great work I've done. Um, if you're interested, let me know. If, you're, um, if you um, need any of these services, if not, can you kindly forward this email to somebody that you think could contract at me? Again, can't drill this enough. With employment, it does require a work, author work authorization social security number. With entrepreneurship, it doesn't. You can just engage in this kind of work. So um, lastly, I'm gonna touch upon what it actually means to start a business. And again, I'm not gonna go through the step-by-step, -step, but I will go through the step-by-steps in the second part of this training that'll take uh, place next Tuesday. Benefits of starting a business, lots of benefits specifically for undocumented people. One, you can hire employees. So my parents who are undocumented have been able to hire um, employees who are US citizens who have work authorization. It also helps with identity protection. So remember that W9-1099 exchange, instead of you using your own name, your own social security number, I-10, you can now use your business name and your business number. You can also avoid complicated questions related to work authorization. So I hear a lot of folks saying, well, I'm being asked to like provide work authorization or I'm being asked to work as an employee. When you own your own business, you own your own business and you're there to like seek clients, you're there to sell a particular product or service. So nobody should question why you're trying to engage in that kind of work. You can be in, uh, exempt from certain freelance laws. You can access financial capital for your business in the form of business credit cards, business loans, business credit lines. Um, you can also be more competitive with larger contracts with like say school districts, with cities. Once you incorporate as a business, there are no questions asked other than whether or not your business can get the job done. Lastly, there are cost-effective benefits such as health insurance premiums that could be cheaper when you incorporate as a business, um, better opportunities for you to um, participate or engage in um, retirement plans as well. Lastly, 
depending on the kind of work you do, and again, this is super just um, kind of like basic information and I'm happy to go over it in more detail, but basically the way all of this works is that a lot of these different permits and licenses may be needed depending on the kind of work you want to do. So business permits, which are required, say for landscaping, um, any food kind of business you're thinking of, construction workers, that is your city and county, regardless of where you live, controls that. So city hall is the place to go for that. Maybe you are interested in the business incorporation, sole proprietorship, partnership, LLC, your state controls that. So each state has their own um, application, their own restriction. So that's who you would go for something like that. Maybe you do need a professional license. So then you're going to have to think about, does my state actually offer a professional license in real estate, law, accounting, hairstyling? So all of these different activities do require sort of you thinking about what do you want to do? Where will you have to go to get additional information about these options? And again, we'll go into much more detail in part two of the training um, to address some of these issues. Unfortunately, we won't have time to go over the inspiring stories of entrepreneurs, but um, we are going to be sharing the slides and each one of these hyperlink to a video. So you'll get an opportunity to hear from some of these amazing entrepreneurs who share tips about how they started. And I did not want to click on that, but it is hyperlinked. <laughs> Um, such as Kai, um, who is based out of DC, engaging in professional services, Alejandro, who's out in Denver, Colorado, doing all sorts of great, um, amazing um, work. I'm not going to go over the recap, but I'll let you all read this when you all get access to the slides. Many other additional resources that you all can check out related to entrepreneurship. Lastly, we are going to be doing a Q&A at our Entrepreneurship Fund with our um, Immigrants Rising Entrepreneurship Fellows. We have one tomorrow and we have one on uh, May 11th. So definitely encourage you to check that out as well as the whole Zoom event around accessing and applying for financial capital that I encourage you all to join. And again, the second part of this training will be next Tuesday. Um, lastly, you all are going to get that survey that we talked about. Please take a moment to complete that. It'll help us um, determine what additional resources, information um, we can share with all of you. And with that, I will open it up for some questions. Thank you so much, Eliana. That was amazing. I know that was a lot of information for folks out at home. And I know you all had a lot of questions, but I know that as you were going through your presentation, you were really kind of tapping in some of that information of the difference between employment and like the freelancing and entrepreneurship. I think a couple of things that they pop back up as um, best practices for folks who are trying to get into the docu hustle. Uh, what are some best ways to deviate or maybe like really understand if someone asks about your status and you're just uh, trying to build a relationship as a client and not as an employee, uh, what are some of those pushbacks or like best ways to that or navigate that from your experience? That's a great question. I mean, a lot of this really goes back to um, really thinking about yourself, a really a personal reflection. What is it that you have to offer? What are your areas where you're most confident in? And really practicing that business pitch as well, or getting really good at writing that email to your friends and family. So a lot of this takes a lot of like, you know, work for yourself to be able to think about what is it that I have to offer so that you don't even have to think about your immigration status. I can go in very confidently, talk about my experience with data, data analytics. I can bring in my LinkedIn profile I'll talk about, um, you know, maybe do some research for the potential clients I want to work with and say, hey, I noticed that in some of these areas, you can probably improve upon um, by incorporating some uh, CRM um, in, into that, you know, is this something that you might be interested in? So finding that level of confidence and ability in your own abilities is totally crucial because then, again, you kind of just forget about your immigration status. At some point, you're just so, you want to get to the point where you're so focused on your skill and abilities and getting those clients more than it, at all, thinking about your immigration status. And again, finding that way to pivot, for example, if somebody is looking to bring you in as an employee, you might say, well, I'm not interested in looking for employment opportunities at this time. I'm really interested in looking, building my clientele base. I'm interested in launching my business. Um, so that's just something that I'm not where, I, where I'm at in this point in my life. Thank you so much. That that also prompts for a little bit of the know your rights, right? Like when to disclose, 
uh, disclose that kind of information. Uh, so that's what came up for, for me when you share that. That's a great point. That's a really great connection to make as well. Yeah, definitely. And then just one more to close out. Uh, there were a couple of questions about whether documented folks or even undocumented folks qualify for like small business loans or to get that started. You have any other just quick uh, overviews of where that is or where folks can look into more? I know that we shared a few resources. If you can just recap. Definitely. So um, unfortunately, the SBA historically has, um, has had restrictions related to immigration status. I have been doing some research and it looks like they were much more flexible with um, the funding related to the COVID-19 crisis. And I have heard of a few folks um, applying and um, the SBA, I even heard an SBA um, director um, address the question around immigration status and said, you know what, we encourage you to apply. We realize these are difficult times. Um, so I do know that that has been um, um, available. Other than that, there are so many different ways to access financial capital. Um, we partner oftentimes with Opportunity Fund, which has publicly come out and said all of their loans are available to anyone regardless of immigration status. Um, many banks also um, totally are um, available to offer both personal and um, business loans. We have many resources all around all the different ways that people can um, access additional funding that is needed. Awesome, thank you so much. And then there's one from Sunny Park that shared, uh, and I know you touched a little bit about on like how much income do we need to start like reporting for taxes? Uh, can you just briefly connect that uh, as a point you made earlier? Definitely. So the kind of ballpark standard number that most folks say is about 25% of your income. And um, definitely if you're making, you know, less than that, you shouldn't expect to have a very big tax burden. If you bring in a lot of your expenses and deductions, you shouldn't really have to think about that. But it's something as you're starting to make more money, you want to start getting organized, you want to start, you know, saving money and um, really thinking about, um, you know, taxes and how you might be able to um, pay the amount that is needed at the end of the year. Awesome. Thank you so much, Elena. Uh, this has been really helpful. There Again, the resources are have been listed on the chat. I know that we're going to be putting them on Facebook and we're going to be definitely sharing even more. Part two is coming up. And for folks that may have missed sections of this, we will have the Spanish session on Thursday. So make sure that you sign up again. And I just want to say, like, I'm eternally grateful to you, to the folks at An Immigrant Rising. This has been super helpful for all of our people. The comments are flooded with thank yous. So thank you, everyone that joined us today. And thank Thanks. you. Thank you so much, Cynthia, and to everybody at United We Dream for making this possible. See you all next week. Thank you. See you.